so what month is this? And, and so what generally happens in July? Huh? It gets very hot. And everybody gets so depressed because um, I, was watching the, I was watching the news last night and the weather was talking about 90 degree temperatures. About how generally in the months of June, July, August, you'll get about three days and then it'll kind of calm down and you might get some that are seven and 17 and 19 and it gets really miserable and everything. And so um, what the um, um, sales market did was they decided, you know, what we need to do is people are so depressed because it's hot out. We need to have a Christmas in July sale. So we can kind of take their mind off of uh, how hot it is and just get them in the stores and spend money, right? Well, now, unfortunately, they're not having any Christmas in July sales because nobody has any money. You know, everybody's afraid, you know, what's going to happen. So in um, recognition of Christmas in July, I actually have a video clip from a Christmas movie that you'll see every year. Mary, I know what I'm going to do tomorrow and the next day and next year and the year after that. I'm shaking the dust of this crummy little town off my feet and I'm going to see the world. I wish I was up there with them. This is me. You remember me? George Bailey. What is it you want, Mary? What do you want? You, you want the moon? Just say the word and I'll throw a lasso around it and pull it down. Uh-oh, uh-oh. I wish I had a million dollars. <laughs> Trouble, Mr. Potter. I need help. At exactly 10.45 p.m. Earth time, that man will be thinking seriously of throwing away God's greatest gift. I don't want any plastic, I don't want any ground floors, and I don't want to get married ever to anyone. You understand that? I want to do what I want to do. story, It's a Wonderful Life. George Bailey started out planning his whole life of how great and wonderful it was going to be. Then all of a sudden things started happening and things started falling apart. He came to the point of getting angry at everybody. To the point where he said, I'm done. I'm finished, standing there in the snow, looking down at the water, ready to give up and jump until an older man, an angel, came and began to talk to him and share with him things. And so many times, we all have the same dreams. We all have the same dreams that our lives are going to be great and wonderful that everything's going to be absolutely perfectly the way we planned. And then all of a sudden, something changes those plans. And then we have to learn, how do I adapt? 
For instance, I had a friend of mine that I met in 1980 when I started, when I came back and started working at Champion. At that point in time, he was in his 30s. He was in a wheelchair and began to work with him and began to start talking to him. He had just graduated out of high school and he had great plans to go to college and do all of these things. He was very athletic. Until during that summer, he was out riding a motorcycle and he hit the railroad tracks at the wrong angle and became paralyzed for the rest of his life. He was going to go sports in college. He still kept up the dream of college, but he couldn't get what he wanted. It all changed in just a split second. Every one of us want a wonderful life. Every one of us want happiness. We want joy. The problem arises is this. If all we're looking for is fame and glory and money and riches and everything else, it ain't going to happen. Very few people in this world become famous. Very few people become rich. Most of us learn how to just survive. Wondering what's going to happen next. But yet we can have a wonderful life. When we learn where a wonderful life comes from. You see, because in this world, you're going to be judged by others based on certain qualifiers. And may I say it this to you? It doesn't matter. There are some people that will look at me and they'll say, well, who are you? You know, you, you run in the circle of preachers. Well, you're not, you don't have a big enough congregation. You don't have a big enough church. So we don't want you speaking for us. We want the people that can draw the people in. I'll never draw a crowd because I tell the truth. And people don't want to hear the truth. People want to be appeased. Just tell me a 15-minute story and let me go home. And and so I'm not going to tell you a 15-minute story, but I'm going to try to let you go home. I was, watching, I was watching last week's sermon, and, and I was watching the time. And I thought, you've got to be kidding me. It went how long? And so I would fast forward the video, and I would look, and I'd say, you haven't even started preaching yet. You took 45 minutes to tell a story. It was like, no wonder you lose everybody. You know, they don't want to hear the story. So hopefully I'll not lose anybody this morning, and I'll try to tell this, my story as I just did in 10 minutes. So we can get to the main point. And I know you all are happy about it. I was talking to some pastors yesterday and people that came for prayer, and I finished my little speech within 20 minutes, and I said, and my congregation wishes that I could do the same thing tomorrow. <laughs> but uh, I'll get you out of here before, I'll get you out of here before noon, I promise, today. I'll try. <laughs> John chapter 1, verses 40 through 42. Three little verses but yet they actually say a lot. 
When you look at these, it begins to tell this story that, that's there. So John chapter 1, verse number 40 through 42, says this. I know nobody brought their Bible today, so they would put them up on the screen. <laughs> Got them? Okay. That's right. Hold them up so everybody behind you can read them. <laughs> Here we go. All righty. <laughs> John chapter 1, verse number 40. Look at what it says. It said, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard John and followed him. Now, you got to understand, who is John here? This is not John the disciple. This is John the Baptist. Okay? Andrew first found his own brother Simon, and he told him, he says, listen, or I'm sorry, back on verse number 40. I may have read it, but I ain't finished with it yet. <laughs> Give you a little... Andrew, Simon's brother, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard John and followed him. So, he was one of the very first of the disciples to hear John the Baptist's message. And John the Baptist's message was very simple and to the point. He said, listen, I am just a voice in the wilderness crying, crying out. My message is very simple. That there is one that is coming after me that I am preparing the way for. The one that you have been looking for called the Messiah. I'm just laying the groundwork because I want you to know he's already here. And pretty soon, you're going to see him. Contrary to popular belief, ladies and gentlemen, John the Baptist had not been preaching for years before Jesus came on the scene. It was a very short period of time, if you go back and look. Very short period of time. John had also spent over 30 years getting ready for this moment. Where had John been? The Bible says he was a wild-looking dude. He had really long hair, a long beard that he didn't cut. It was all matted. He ate locusts and wild honey. And anybody that has had a beard knows that when you're eating something that is liquid, even if you don't have a beard, it will sometimes run down the chin and onto your shirts, if that's what you have, or a blouse. But when you got a beard or mustache, it's good for leftovers. But this was John. He had the honey and the locusts. He looked like, I don't know about this guy. He was strange. But he was telling them about Jesus. And so John, or Andrew, started following John. And look at what he said. He first found his own brother, Simon. And he told him, listen, this John that was talking about this Messiah, I found him. I have found him. You need to come and see. He said, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ or Christos, the Son of God. And he brought Simon to Jesus. And when Jesus saw him, he said, you're Simon. I know who you are. 
I know your name. You're the son of John, one of the other brothers. You will be called what? Cephas. I'm changing your name, which being interpreted or translated meant Peter. Later on, you'll understand it meant Little Rock because that's who he was. He was the rock, part of a foundation that was there. So when you look at this, you find two guys in the story, Andrew and Peter. What you'll find is this. Not much about Andrew through the rest of the Bible. You'll find his name mentioned a few times, but you don't find him doing anything out front. Nothing spectacular. Nothing really to be writing home about. But his brother Peter, oh boy, everybody writes about him. Everybody talks about Peter. Even to this day, everybody talks about Peter. Some of the good characteristics and some of the bad. And they begin to start talking about these things. Because you see, Andrew liked to stay in the background. But can I say something to you? If Andrew hadn't done what Andrew did, we probably would not have the New Testament today. Sure, it had many different writers. But in the background is Andrew who led Peter to Christ. And subsequently you read all about Peter and how on the day of Pentecost he preached a sermon and thousands of people got saved. And from those thousands of people they were dispersed and went out and they began to all of a sudden multiply in their homes with home churches. And they began to multiply and multiply and multiply until all of a sudden the whole place of Jerusalem was a buzz about Jesus and Christ who had been born and died and arose and the story that he was telling them that he was coming back. You see, when you begin to read in the book of John in the first chapter, when you begin to read, Andrew was one of the first disciples to follow Christ. One of the first. Follow me for a minute. How long was Andrew saved before he led Peter to Jesus? Well, he had to go through three years of discipleship training, four years of seminary, and then he had to learn how to preach after that, and and then how to do all of this other stuff before he could actually tell Peter about Jesus. How long was he saved? Huh? Maybe a few hours, a few minutes. The Bible doesn't tell us how long it was that he went and told Peter. But it wasn't months, and it wasn't weeks, and it wasn't days. Because they worked together as fishermen. Every day they would go fishing. So I believe it's less than 24 hours. If you hang with me, I think it was probably a couple of hours. What what amazing thing. Somebody got saved and within two hours they they were leading someone else to Jesus. Well, you don't understand, Pastor. I can't do that. I don't know much about Jesus. You know enough that God saved. You know enough that he changed something about you. You know something is different because you're excited 
When you find Jesus, ladies and gentlemen, you're excited. Something occurs and something happens. And let me say this to you all. It is a wonderful life. Do we get sick? Yes. Do we lose jobs? Yes. Do we get cussed out? Yes. Do we get ridiculed? Yes. Am I stereotyped because I'm a Baptist preacher? Absolutely. You're like a typical Baptist preacher. You don't know when to shut up. Yes. Absolutely true. But the thing of it is, is that's life. But that ain't life. What did Jesus say? He says, I come that give you life more abundant. Here's the issue. Christians complain that they go through trials. Christians ask God, why me? And God asks ask you back the question, why not you? Paul says, I count it a blessing to suffer with Jesus Christ. Why? Because sometimes in my suffering is when God uses my suffering to reach other people. For instance, you've been diagnosed I can use my brother. He's been diagnosed with cancer four times? Four times. Each time going through a treatment, right? And each time, how many people did you meet during those treatments? Quite a few. And how many did you tell about Jesus? A whole bunch. Oh, but I've got cancer. Oh, absolutely. It changed your story. You did the same thing. I'm sure Sue's doing the same thing. And the healing that we go through with the people that are going through the same issues and the same problems, we begin to tell them, hold on a minute, that's not the end of the story. There's something on the other side of this story. Whether I make it or whether I don't, there's still something on the other end of this story. And may I say this to you, I'm looking forward to be living to be 199. Will I make it? Probably not. Would I really want to? No. Because every day that I live delays one more day to where I get to go home. Okay? But I'll take the delays. I'm in no hurry to go home yet. I've got so much more to do here. But every moment, we're to live as this is our last moment. What if you knew that you were going to die within the next five minutes? What would you be doing right now? I'd be spending all my money. (laughs) Either that or taking all my credit cards and just having a big old fun because I know I'm not going to have to pay for them, right? That's what some people would do. (laughs) No. No. But that's what some people would say. I'll, I just want to live. If I know I've got five, min, five minutes or five hours or five days, I'm going to go out and just live it up. Really? What about sharing with people about where you're going and what, where you're headed to? When you look at Andrew... Okay, we talked about Peter. Peter's name meant rock. Andrew meant manly. Okay? He was a fisherman. And it meant manly. My, um, my sister-in-law uh, posted a picture of my father-in-law who had gone deep sea fishing. And she had posted it out on Facebook. And, and my father-in-law worked at Armco and he, he was really very strong man. And you can see him. He had caught this big fish. And he is doing the best he can to reel that fish in. 
I don't know how big it was because they never had the picture of how big the fish was. But I think somewhere there was a picture, but it wasn't there. It was a big fish. Now, if it was me, the fish would have won. Okay? Because number one, I will never be named Andrew because I'm not a big, strong guy to be able to handle that fish. I would be asking a couple other people to handle it for me. But just let me take the picture of it, okay? And say it was on my pole. It doesn't matter who reeled it in, it was on my pole. But Andrew, the Bible says, he was, he was a manly man. The Bible tells us that Jesus was walking by when he saw John and he got baptized in the River Jordan. And that's where Andrew met Jesus. Think about this for a minute. Jesus is coming up out of the water from his baptism and people are getting saved. The impact that we can have on people doesn't have to be months and years. The impact that we can make upon people, ladies and gentlemen, can be seconds, minutes. That's why I say to you that you need to make every moment of every conversation when you have with people because you never know if you're ever going to cross paths with those people ever again. So you are given a very short window to make an impact for eternity on someone. And so the question arises is this, when someone walks away from meeting you, what do they say? Somebody will say, well, what did you, what happened to you today? Or they go home and somebody say, what happened to you today? And nothing, nothing major. No, what ought to happen is when they say, hey, what happened to you today? I met this person. They just walked up out of the blue and they started talking to me and I'll never forget that conversation or I'll never forget how they looked. I'll never forget the expressions. That's what the impact we should make on people We shouldn't just blend in like everybody else and become nothing other than a face in a crowd or a number. Everybody we should meet, we should leave a lasting impression upon. Unfortunately, we don't always do that. Sometimes we're in a hurry that we miss the moments. Some of my Shopping trips turn into hours. And I have to make sure I don't have anything melting in my shopping cart. So I always head there last before I'm leaving out. So here's what happens, okay? If we want to understand to have a wonderful life, there's a couple things we need to understand. Number one is just like Andrew He saw the value of individual people. You see, a lot of times what we do is we don't look at the individual person. We stereotype people when we see them. I I, I shared with you, you know, I I, I grew up and, and in the church that I grew up, it was very stringent strict in a lot of their beliefs. One of them was men don't wear earrings. If you do, you had to make sure you wore it on the right side, whichever right side was. And that was a stereotype. You you know, if you wore it on the one side, um, you were one, and if you wore it on the other side, you were just weird. 
That was a stereotype. So when I pastored a church, there was a guy who wanted to get up and sing a special. And he had an earring in. And I told him, no, you can't. Not until you take the earring out. The guy was a Christian. And he wanted to sing. He could play the guitar and he had a voice. And here I am telling him he can't use his gift for God because he's got an earring in. Do I do that today? Absolutely not. If you want to wear earrings and piercings, that's, your, that's y'all's. Okay? Me, I don't like needles. That's why I'll never have a piercing and I'll never have a tattoo. Because pain and I just don't agree with things. But if you want to, that's you. And I'm not going to judge you based upon what you've got on or what you look like. Because it isn't the outside of the person that we're looking at anyway, ladies and gentlemen. It's the inside of that individual. Who are they? And who I am is not based upon what you see here. Who I am is based upon my values that come from deep inside. Or they should be. In my 66 years of life, I've learned certain things. And I've learned that God says he has created all of us. And you know what he said? He says that we are all wonderfully created. And who am I to tell God he messed up on somebody? He knows a heck of a lot more than I ever knew. And I'm ever going to know. And he knows the qualifications of that individual that I don't even see yet until I get to talking to them, and then I get to see who they are. And sometimes, may I say this to y'all? Sometimes the person that you judge at first glance, give them a second look and bury the first impression. Wipe the first impression totally out of there. I don't care if you thought they were the best person in the world because they may have been the best person in the world on the first impression and turned out to be the lowest, dirty, rotten scoundrel who ever lived on the face of the earth. Or you could have found that you met somebody the very first time as a dirty, rotten scoundrel and they could have become your best friend. Ask my wife. As the old saying says, you can't judge a book by its cover. You don't. You don't judge people by their outside appearance, ladies and gentlemen. So many times we begin to do this, but he saw the value, the value of individual people. Look at what, look at what Andrew did, a couple of things. Number one, he brought people, he brought Peter to Jesus, just one. When they were on the mountain, mountainside and Jesus was, was uh, teaching all day long and the people, it was getting nighttime and they said, Lord, you need to send them away. They've been here all day and they're hungry. We don't have anything to eat. He said, you go out there and you find and see if anybody's got anything. Peter brought this little boy who had a sack lunch to Jesus not Peter, Andrew. Andrew brought the little boy to Jesus. And what did he do? From that little boy's lunch, Jesus fed the multitude. What if Andrew hadn't been observant? Had just walked on by and said, oh, yeah, we didn't find any, any food out there that's going to feed this crowd those people would have went home hungry. But instead, they went home with their bellies full and 12 disciples had a bushel full of food left over for each one of them to last them for a while 
when Jesus told them, follow me, leave everything home. I'll take care of you. I'll feed you. I'll clothe you. I'll make sure that you're kept safe. We'll find places for you to sleep at night. We'll take care of you. And he began to do this. We begin to find out that actually when you look at it, Andrew was really the first home missionary in the Bible. He was the very first one that started bringing people to Jesus and these things that he was done. But he also was not only the first home mission. If you read over in the book, um, over in the book of John chapter 12, you also find that he was the first form missionary because he started bringing the Greeks to Jesus. Hold on. He was a Jew reaching out to the Greek and bringing them to Jesus. That's who Andrew was. He knew these things. There's a story of a young man and you'll probably never ever hear this name, okay? His name is Edward Kimball, not the guy on the fugitive, okay? There's another guy. And he was a Sunday school teacher. And he had a young man in his Sunday school class that he led to Jesus. The young man's name was D.L. Moody. Go read about the life of D.L. Moody. This Sunday school teacher led one of the greatest preachers of all time to Jesus. Preachers today are still studying his sermons. They're still reading his notes. They're still using his quotes. And he was from the 1800s. His quotes, his sermons, his stories are still relevant today. And D.L. Moody, through the message that God used through him, led many to the Lord because of one Sunday school teacher who looked and valued the life of that child on the south side of Chicago, where nobody thought anybody was worth anything over there. But this Sunday school teacher saw the value of one person and the value of that life, and he led him to the Lord. The second thing that Andrew saw was he saw the, he saw the value of insignificant gifts. I hear people all the time say, you don't understand. I don't have this, or I don't have that. God says you don't need that. All you need is me. You got Jesus. Isn't that enough to be able to do those things? Again, what did we see? John or, or Andrew says, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? I don't know how you're going to do this, but here's what we've got. And the insignificant gift fed those. And so many times we need to understand that God can take what little you have and explode it. I hear people all the time say, you don't understand. In, in church, you don't understand, Pastor. All I've got left is a quarter. May I say this to you? Jesus and his disciples were standing at the door, like back there, and they had these tens like we do back there. And the people were coming into the, 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 the uh, sanctuary of worship. They didn't pass around offering plates. And I keep saying I'm not going to do this because passing around offering plates is the worst thing that we've ever developed in church because the Bible says that you bring your offerings with a joyful heart, which says this, that as soon as they walked in the door, they deposited their offering there. And I know some people say, well, nobody should know whatever I give. His disciples were sitting there or standing there watching as the people came in. 
And they watched, they watched this, some of these guys that were dropping in their gold and their shekels and their whatever they had, all their coins and their, if they had folded money, they were, you know, it was bringing all of that. And they were watching. And they knew who was giving. And they asked Jesus, boy, who gave the most here? And he says, remember that little widow woman? who came in with two, two mites, basically one penny, one penny. She gave the most, and they're sitting there looking. Hold on a minute. We, we saw this dude dressed up, man. He, he, I mean, he was decked out, fine purple. He, I mean, he had the best chariot in the lot. I mean, he's got the house on the top of the hill that everybody looks up to. Man, he... He gave a whole bunch of that. About half that thing was all of his money that he was pouring out of his pockets and all of this stuff. And he says, no, uh uh-uh. She gave the most. To them, it was insignificant. But you know what Jesus said? She gave everything she had. She was a widow. She gave everything she had. You know what God's saying to us, ladies and gentlemen? He isn't asking for your $500 or your $1,000 or your million dollars or whatever. Be cool. But that's not what he's asking. What he's asking is this. Will you let me control your money? Will you let me control your car? Will you let me control your life? But you don't understand, Jesus, If you're controlling my life, I ain't going to have any fun. I can tell you something. I have never had so much fun in my life as to being as a Christian. And I can wake up tomorrow and remember what I did yesterday. And I won't have to ask anybody if I made a fool of myself. I'll know. They don't have to plaster it all over Facebook. I know what I did. Because why? The things that he's given us, ladies and gentlemen, you may think they're insignificant, but they matter. Last thing, and that is this. He saw the value of a service that nobody else recognized or an inconspicuous service. What did Andrew want to do? Andrew was one of those people who labored in humble places. You would never find Andrew standing up in church saying, look at what I did. Oh, I've got perfect attendance. I've led 799 people to Jesus. I baptized 844. He didn't do that. What he did was, this is what I was called to do. Who recognized it? God did. Or Jesus. You know what? Andrew was one of those people who always worked behind the scenes. He was never the one out front. Never the one out front. He wasn't the one that was always recognized, but can I say this to you? He probably did more than any of the rest of them. But you don't see it written about his story. And so many times we never read about Andrew preaching to the multitudes or the founded by any churches, but let me finish with this and tell you what Andrew did. Andrew took the gospel north into what we call today as Russia. And they believe that he also took the gospel to Scotland. Those are two different places. But ultimately, he was crucified in a little little town called Achaia. 
you'll read it in the Bible, in southern Greece, near Athens. He founded a church in Russia, founded a church in Scotland, and he died in Greece. And ladies and gentlemen, they didn't have airplanes. They had boats. They walked or they would ride. But one account said that he led the wife of a, of a Roman governor to Christ. And it so infuriated her husband that he demanded that his wife recant her devotion to Jesus Christ, and she refused. And so the governor had Andrew crucified for what he did. Listen, he was crucified. Who else do you know was crucified? Peter, who is the brother of Andrew. Only Peter said, I'm not worthy to be crucified the way my Lord was. Crucify me upside down. Andrew, ladies and gentlemen, was not crucified the way Jesus was either. Instead of nailing him to a cross, they took like leather uh, straps and tied him to the cross. And you want to know why? To prolong his agony so that he wouldn't die quickly. They wanted him to die a slow, painful death. This one, on the story of, of Andrew, the story goes that they believe that Andrew hung on that cross for two days. For two days. So that everybody that passed by him could see what would happen to them if they told anybody about Jesus. This will be your death. People were going back and forth for two days watching him watching him die. But let me tell you something. They may have watched him die, but his legacy still goes on because he told people about Jesus. So this morning as we get a song of an invitation, my question has always been the last four weeks, and that is this. Who's your one? Who's the one that you know that you need to tell about Jesus. Maybe you've got more than one. We got a young lady that's not here today because her uncle is very sick and they don't know if he's gonna make it. He's going to surgery, I believe tomorrow. They're letting them visit with him today. And she said, I can't be there tomorrow but will you pray for me? She says, because my uncle is lost and he's my one. And I'm gonna make sure that he knows about Jesus before he goes to surgery tomorrow. I'm gonna know that he knows about Jesus just in case something happens. And she says, I want you to pray that before we walk out of there, he has come to know Jesus, would you? And I said, absolutely, absolutely. And I've been praying since last night. God, would you give her the words that will touch his heart, that he'll give his life to you. Whether he comes through the surgery, he doesn't come through the surgery. He may die here, but he'll live forever. And that's the question, where will you live? in eternity. Let's stand.
So many times we fail to realize without God, there's a song, it's just called Dead Man Walking. And that's all we are. We're going through the motions until we understand that what life is all about really is Jesus and all that that's there. Uh, we don't have services tonight. Enjoy your time with your family if you haven't had a chance. Uh, if you've eaten too much this weekend, uh, go home, take a nap. And if you have to get up tomorrow and go to work, just set your alarm, okay? But just make sure that it's a 24-hour clock because you don't want to wake up at 7 tonight and think, oh, well, I've got to get up and go to work. We want to make sure that you get your rest and everything, okay? So remember all of that and everything. And, and so today, instead of praying, um, I actually have a video um, that is kind of set to some music. And uh, so uh, here's the way we'll be dismissed today. So if you play the video, Mark. 